hey, good morning. It's soon to be good afternoon. We'll kick off this tour properly at midday. Um, I'm out in the middle of the battlefield, so if the live stream drops out, if the cell reception drops out, I apologize for that. I do have a backup plan. It's the usual backup plan is that I will immediately um, record the entire tour offline and then as soon as I can upload it to um, Facebook and YouTube. So that's the backup plan if the network connection drops out and God willing it won't drop out. Um, it's just that it does sometimes when we're out on these remote battlefield locations. So I'm going to get the tour kicked off in just a minute or so. First rule of being on the battlefield, any battlefield that you're touring is to remain hydrated. Safety brief for the day, start hydrated, stay hydrated. That's your safety brief for the day. Um, okay, so we may as well kick this off. We are, well I am, out here today on the Antietam battlefield, so Sharpsburg, Maryland. Um, the battle is sometimes known as the Battle of Sharpsburg after the town. Um, otherwise known as the Battle of Antietam after Antietam Creek. Um, out here on the battlefield today, today is August the 3rd, 2021. This is part of the Lunchtime Tour series, a short series of, well sorry, a series of short 30 to 45 minute uh, battlefield tours that we're doing in the lunch hour. So if you're sitting at your desk eating a sandwich and you're uh, thinking of, well, I haven't got a podcast to listen to, or I haven't bought a book with me today, then you can tune in on Tuesdays to these um, live streams. I'm doing 30, 45 minutes as quickly as we can, just to cover a small piece of the battlefield. Um, my name is David Boba. Um, I'm the tour guide here today for Walking the Ground. Thanks for joining me. The tour today is going to focus on an individual regiment and um, we typically do this on the short tours we don't do a grand here's what happened at the battle of antietam um, we'll find one regiment so at gettysburg for example we did the 28th virginia i'm going to be at gettysburg again next week and we'll be doing a tour on um, latimer's artillery battery on benners hill but today we're looking at the 9th new york volunteer infantry regiment a zouave regiment from their flamboyant clothing hawkins zouaves sometimes known as the Little Zouaves or the New York Zouaves. We're looking at that one regiment, its actions on that day, and in focusing on the one regiment, we get like a micro story that fits neatly into this short format tour. So, um, 9th New York, um, raised in 1861 in New York, and uh, fought in the... Ooh, the uh, uh, Burnside's um, coastal campaign down in North Carolina and then when Burnside's horses were brought back up to um, Maryland and to form 9th Corps were obviously part of 9th Corps. So I want to look at the... Um, oh, we did talk about the nicknames as well. So the nucleus of the regiment was a pre-war company military club called the uh, Company of New York Zouaves. So pre-war military club for men that wanted to dress in fancy Zouave uniforms to perform military exercises. When the war broke out, um, Colonel Rush Hawkins, or sorry, Rush Hawkins, um, traveled to Albany, offered his services of his uh, military club to the governor of New York, who commissioned him as a colonel in the state militia and sent him back to New York City to raise that regiment uh, to a strength of 800 men, which he was able to do um, using his uh, club as a cadre, as a nucleus. Um, they also um, took a company of the 18th New York Militia into their body, and then the rest of the men that they recruited were raw volunteers for the regiment. They mustered into state service in April 1861 um, as 10 companies strong. Um, one of the companies, Company K, was equipped with Dahlgren boat howitzers, so light howitzers and organized as an integral um, battalion battery. Um, they were mustered into federal service on May 4th, 1861, and after a brief period of training, moved down to Fortress Monroe in Virginia, and then later to North Carolina, where they participated in the um, Burnside's Coastal Campaign, so at Harris Inlet, um, Battle of Roanoke Island, um, Battle of South Mills. So that's part of that 
Anaconda campaign of Winfield Scott, the commanding general at the beginning of the war, had a plan to strangle the Confederacy. So it would involve coastal blockades on the Atlantic and on the Gulf Coast. It would involve moving down the Mississippi River and strangling the Confederacy. So landing troops on the North Carolina littoral, like an amphibious landing and taking control of Hatteras Island, Roanoke Island, was part of that anaconda plan, that blockading force. And the 9th New York participated in that under the command of uh, Major General Ambrose Burnside. Uh, so we are looking at the, uh, after that, the conclusion of the uh, coastal campaign in July of 1862. The regiment moved back to Virginia to Newport News just outside Fortress Monroe and where Burnside's coastal division was reorganized into the 9th Army Corps, expanded into the 9th Army Corps of um, multiple divisions and then would become eventually uh, part of the Army of the Potomac. So it only became part of the Army of the Potomac at the beginning of September 1862. Battle of Antietam is the 17th of September. Battle of South Mountain is the 14th of September. So Burnside's 9th Corps had not been part of the Army of Potomac and exercised with the Army of Potomac for very long, basically two weeks um, before it was thrown into combat as Army of the Potomac. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the 9th New York. We call them a Zouave Regiment. I don't know whether anybody knows what a Zouave Regiment is. I actually have a picture from Dan Troiani of the 9th New York. So you've seen a standard um, Union infantryman of the period, blue sack coat, uh, plain trousers, plain bumper cap, etc. Well, the Zouaves were dressed in a more extravagant manner. You can see the chasseur pants, the short jacket with the red piping. Um, these men have uh, a red sash around their waist, white gaiters on their shoes. They have a red fez instead of a blue cap, so they're very flamboyantly dressed, very much in the French military style, which was on vogue in the period. So, which is why they call themselves a Zouave Regiment. The French army had North African Zouave Regiments. The Foreign Legion of this period was dressed in a very similar manner, and um, French chasseurs were dressed in a very similar manner. And that had been observed by American military observers during the Crimean War and the tradition and the flamboyance of that had been brought back to the United States. And so some of the volunteer regiments raised in 1861-1862 um, named themselves Zouaves and uh, took on this very fancy uniform um, disposition that they had. So that was a quick rundown that brings us to Antietam. Well, it doesn't quite bring us to Antietam. Um, so on September the 14th, Ambrose Burnside is commanding 9th Corps. Um, he is a personal friend of General McClellan, the commander of the Army of the Potomac, and McClellan selects Burnside to command the right wing of the army. He assigns him his own 9th Corps and also 1st Corps under Joe Hooker. So um, uh, Burnside, in command of the right wing of the army, passes command of 9th Corps to Major General Jesse Reno. So the 9th New York is part of 9th Corps. It's part of 9th Corps' 3rd Division, 1st uh, Brigade of the 3rd Division, under Brigadier General Fair, uh, Fairfield. And on the 14th, the Corps fought at South Mountain. So if you come to Gettysburg, sorry, if you come to Antietam from the north, if you're coming from the direction of Frederick or Baltimore, you'll come across South Mountain into Boonesboro. So the 9th Corps fought at Fox's Gap on the 14th, and that is where uh, Major General Jesse Reno was actually killed at Fox's Gap, so they lost the um, Corps commander and the command of the Corps then passed to Brigadier General Jacob Cox. So there's some confusion now in 9th Corps as far as command goes. Burnside's been removed from direct Corps command and is commanding the wing. Um, his temporary replacement has been killed and so a replacement for that replacement is now in charge. So there could be some confusion in the chain of communication and the chain of command and that may have some effect on Burnside's actions on the day of the Battle of um, Antietam. Uh, after the Battle of South Mountain there's a delay. The Union Army does not advance very quickly. It advances into Boonesboro and some men advance as far as Keedysville, just a little bit up the, um, the turnpike there. But they don't advance in pursuit of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. 
that gives General Lee a chance to um, consolidate his forces along Antietam Creek here at Sharpsburg, which he does. So um, General McClellan, the uh, commander of the Army of the Potomac, um, there he is, Little Mac, um, often criticised for having an attack of the slows, being too cautious. Uh, he was a phenomenal organiser and had a great strategic view of the war, but he was tactically cautious. Um, he didn't want to unnecessarily risk his army, which he really did consider to be his army. Um, so sometimes he was slow in the offensive, uh, would overestimate the enemy's strength, and was criticised by Lincoln himself as having an attack of the slows. So after the Battle of South Mountain, McClellan does not follow up that attack. Uh, the attack will begin on uh, September the 17th, so three days later, and that's given Lee a lot of time to reorganise his forces and consolidate the two wings of his army, Jackson's Corps and Longstreet's Corps, here at Sharpsburg. So 9th Corps, uh, under nominal command of uh, old Ambrose Burnside there, famous for his side whiskers that became known as Burnsides, then sideburns so derives from that. So Burnside's famous for several things, the bridge here at Antietam, Burnside's Bridge, the old side whiskers, the Burnside carbine that he invented, and um, notably his disastrous command of the army at Fredericksburg later on in 1862. But Burnside has command of this wing. It is the left wing, well it's technically the right wing of the Union Army, but he's operating almost on the left of the line, so it's very confusing with 9th Corps. Um, Burnside has an objective which is to turn the Confederate flank. Uh, there are two ways across. There's the Ruhlbach Bridge across Antietam Creek, which he's going to directly assault and try and sweep that bridge. But then he sends the 3rd Division under Brigadier General Rodman in a flanking movement uh, downriver to find Sudley's Ford, and they will ford the river uh, further down and make a turning movement on the Confederate flank. So we're talking about 9th New York, uh, part of that 3rd Division, 1st Brigade. Uh, we call them Hawkins Zouars, but Colonel Hawkins was not present for duty that day. He'd been wounded at South Mountain. Um, so command on the 17th had passed to Lieutenant Colonel Kimball, his uh, deputy commander. So he was in command on that day. The 9th had bivouacked on the field of battle after South Mountain. Um, they'd slept in drizzle and rain in cornfields. They'd moved down on the 15th towards Keedysville, and they did not move until the night of the 16th before they moved into position here on the morning of the 17th, overlooking Antietam Creek. So on the morning of the 17th, uh, Confederate guns, artillery battery of eight guns, opened up on the night of New York, it's recorded in Kimball's battle report for the battle that he lost 14 wounded as a result of this artillery attack early in the morning and he had to pull his regiment back out of artillery range so he'd unknowingly camped overnight within artillery range of the Confederate guns so he had to pull that back straight away. As I said Company K of the regiment was equipped with um, Dahlgren boat howitzers still at this period so he had infantry companies but he also had uh, an improvised artillery battery within his own regiment. They attempted to return fire and silence the guns. It wasn't particularly effective uh, because the boat howitzers, though they're 12 pounders, have a, a little shorter range than the heavier 12 pounders and howitzers of the um, Confederate artillery in that period. So the Confederate forces facing them across the creek were Longstreet's wing. So there he is. You know this fellow, General Longstreet. It was Longstreet's wing, it weren't quite called the first corps yet, but it was Longstreet's wing, so James Longstreet. West Point class of 1842, veteran of the war in Mexico, veteran of the Texas frontier, um, latterly a quartermaster and a paymaster in the old army. Um, when the southern states seceded, Longstreet joined the Confederacy, commanded a brigade at Bull Run, um, commanded a division in the peninsula, and has now been promoted to Major General and is commanding a wing of the army. Um, after the Battle of Antietam, he will be promoted to Lieutenant General, and they will start to call his wing of the army the First Corps. 
but he's regarded as a very solid commander by General Lee, trusted by General Lee, um, who regards um, Longstreet as his war horse, his right hand and his war horse. So that's who's holding the position up here on the hill. Uh, two brigades in particular, Kemper's Brigade and Drayton's Brigade, are holding a position up here on the hill. Georgians, South Carolinians and Virginia troops. Um, between them is 10 regiments of Confederate infantry supported by artillery up on these heights. So down just behind me is the River Valley and the Ford crossings. Um, third Division is going to cross those fords at about one o'clock in the afternoon. So the main attack is going on on the bridge, which is drawing away some of the Confederate attention. They're trying to charge across that Roebuck Bridge in three different waves of assaults, which will eventually succeed. But this flanking movement at 1 p.m. is to turn the flank of the Confederate Army and see if they can get round behind Longstreet's lines with this 3rd Division. So the division fords the river, forms line of battle and starts moving up the high ground. So, okay, just bear with me because I dropped this note card earlier on. So the 9th New York is part of Fairchild's Brigade. Fairchild's Brigade, the 1st Brigade, a 3rd Division in 9th Corps, comprises the 9th New York, the 89th New York, and the 103rd New York. So it's three regiments of New York infantry moving up this hill in immaculate configuration, uh, fixed bayonets at the point of bayonet, and... Kimball's Battle Report says, I'm going to read from Kimball's Battle Report, that's what I was looking for. Uh, the Ninth formed line of battle and pushed back the entire line of Confederate skirmishers. So there's a skirmish line here, a regiment of um, Georgia infantry that's pushed back onto Drayton and Kemper's brigades. The Zouaves moved a quarter of a mile up the hill onto a small rise. They're about 800 yards from the Confederate main position at that point. They come under artillery fire, heavy, heavy artillery fire. Um, now, despite that artillery fire, they're starting to take casualties. The order is given to advance. Fairchild's brigade moves forward um, with the Zouaves moving forward in their um, extravagant clothing, their chasseur pants, um, their red fezes. They're very distinguishable on the battlefield, separate from an ordinarily dressed Union Regiment. They have their colour guard with the Union flag, the national flag, and they also have their regimental flag, a large red silk flag with the regimental motto, Toujours Prêt, always ready, embroidered upon it. So they're very visible presence on the battlefield. They are climbing the slope as fast as they can against these two brigades, Kemper's and Drayton's brigades. So effectively one regiment against ten at this point. But the ninth moved as if they were on a parade ground, according to Kimball. It was a smooth action. They moved in line of battle, they were dressed upon their colours, and they moved to within 600 yards of the Confederate artillery and before the shell fire really started to take account. One shell wiped out the entire colour guard, so the colour, you know, the colour party and the colour guard were knocked down by a shell, killed and wounded. Uh, volunteers ran forward to grab those flags and lead the men forward lead the regiment forward. The 9th moved closer to the Confederate line, forward up the hill. Kimball gave the order to charge. So, you know, they've been moving at a steady pace, and now he gave the order, like, charge, let's go. Um, the Zouaves moved forward, their battle cry of zoo, 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 that's their battle cry, and they charge forward up the hill, taking casualties as they go. Kimball's battle report noted the infantry fire was like hail around and among us, providing the most dreadful carnage. Not a man who was not wounded, wavered or faltered, but all pressed on with charged bayonets to the top of the hill. So they're taking heavy casualties, but the survivors are pushing forward. Nobody is stopping. Everybody is pushing forward. So you can just imagine the sight. You have brightly dressed, extravagantly dressed, Zouaves moving forward. Um, they have what the French would call elan, style, spirit. But they are moving forward with the bayonet under heavy fire, so they have what the French would call cran, or guts. They have the guts to take that attack. So not only are they dressed as French Zouaves, they have the spirit of the French Zouave with them as well when they take this hill. So their battle colour is being torn by uh, musket and artillery fire. Men are falling all around, but the regiment presses on and takes the top of the hill, 
pushing back and routing both of those Confederate brigades. So Drayton's brigade breaks first, Kemper's brigade breaks next, and they're driven back by effectively one regiment of very angry New York infantry. Um, the 89th New York come up in support with the 103rd, I think the additional brigade. So on the flank here would be the 8th Connecticut from 1st Division. So they're coming up onto this hill. It's an exposed position today. It's farmland today. Um, the Harpers Ferry Road runs along this direction. This is where the Confederates have fallen back to, towards the Harpers Ferry Road. And there's a residential building all along that road at the moment. So actually to get to this part of the battlefield, you have to park at the side of the road and come down a footpath behind some houses and through some farmland to a very remote corner of the battlefield, which is fenced in here. Um, and I'll post some photographs of the monument and the terrain around here later on on the, on the Facebook page. So they've pushed back the Confederate army, these two brigades that have gone on to Longstreet's Corps. Well, Longstreet's not having that. He needs those Union guys pushed off this ridge. So um, Drayton's Brigade and Kemper's Brigade organised for a counterattack. General Rodman, Brigadier General Rodman, commanding the 3rd Division, can see what's about to happen. Also at this point, AP Hill's Light Division arrives on the field as support for Longstreet. So Longstreet has a fresh division that's arrived by speed march from Harbour's Ferry, AP Hill, so he can throw in another division into the attack to drive these men off the hill. So Brigadier General Rodman sees this and he rides forward on his horse across open ground to get to this advanced position because he wants the men to know that they need to pull back, that they're not going to be able to hold this position, they're going to be overrun. This cannon marker behind me is to Brigadier General Isaac Rodman. He fell about 200 yards further down the hill, felled by a Manet ball through his lung, mortally wounded, and would die in a field hospital later. So, as I was talking about the confusion that we have in command of 9th Corps, Burnside removed from direct command, Jesse Reno has been killed at South Mountain, um, Cox is in temporary command of the entire Corps, um, now one of the divisional commanders is down. So the troops up here are left without a direct commander. Um, Fairchild, in command of the brigade, sees the tenuous position that the men are in and orders the men of his brigade, the 9th, the 89th and the 103rd, to withdraw. Um, the 89th and the 103rd obey the order and begin the uh, retrograde movement under fire. But the 9th under Kimball they are disinclined to give up the ground that has been so costly for them to take. They're in no mood to retreat and they want to hold their ground. The Zouars had lost a lot of men during that attack um, and they believe that they will lose more men in the retreat and that will also mean that they'll have to leave their wounded on the field and they do not want to do that. They have the spirit, they have the um, unit cohesion, the pride in their unit, that they do not want to retreat and they do not want to leave their wounded on the field. So they refuse the order to retreat. Kimball refuses the order to retreat. Um, a staff officer is sent to find a senior officer. Uh, he finally finds um, Brigadier General Orlando Wilcox, uh, commanding 1st Division in 9th Corps, and he says there's a regiment of Zouaves up there who will not fall back. They're going to be completely overrun and destroyed. Wilcox himself comes forward and orders Kimball, Lieutenant Colonel Kimball is being ordered by Brigadier General, a senior officer, to get off the field. Um, Kimball was furious and he actually yelled, you know, so he had an argument with Wilcox. And he says, does this look like a regiment in defeat? You know, I'm not defeated, you know, there's only a few of us left, but we're not defeated. We are not going to come off this battlefield as a defeated regiment. You're going to have to order us off. So reluctantly and with bitterness, um, Kimball accedes to Wilcox's orders and begins withdrawal of the 9th New York from the field. And he wrote in his battle report, Kimball wrote, the men retired in good order at a slow step and with tears in their eyes at the necessity which compelled them to leave the field that they had so dearly won. So uh, Kimball was angry, the survivors of the 9th were angry. And the casualties had indeed really been high up here on the battlefield that day. The 9th New York came into the Battle of Antietam with 373 men mustered for duty. Um, during the battle, they suffered 45 killed, 176 wounded, 
14 missing. So that's a total of 235 casualties from 373 men. That's a 63% casualty rate, a horrific casualty rate. So to put that in perspective, and the next day when the regiment mustered men for service, the regiment only had 98 men fit for service the day after the battle. So they had suffered horrendous casualties up here on the hill. This is regarded as the high point of the Union advance that day. This is the furthest that the Union advanced on this flank, failed to turn Longstreet's flank um, because Longstreet would not have that flank turned. And also he now had A.P. Hill's men in reserve ready to put in a counterattack. So this flank of the Confederate Army held on that day. The casualty numbers really are not unusual um, for the Battle of Antietam. Antietam was a very, very costly battle for both sides. It is the single bloodiest day of the Civil War. So some battles have higher casualty rates. Gettysburg has a higher casualty rate, but that's because Gettysburg is fought over a three-day period. In a single day, in a single day's action, Antietam is the bloodiest day in a single day's action. Um, losses were uh, 12,400 Union, 10,320 Confederate, so a total of 22,720 men were casualties here on the battlefield. Now, as the National Park Service um, uh, historians like to remind us, and uh, Ken Burns sometimes forgets, casualties does not mean dead. Casualties is killed in action, wounded in action, missing in action, prisoners of war. So not all of these men were killed. Um, more men were wounded than killed, and men also went missing and men were also captured as prisoners of war, but it's a direct loss. So the casualty rate is the overall casualty rate. And as a result of that, um, 22,000 men, almost 23,000 men here, were casualties, killed, wounded, missing, captured, on that 17th of September, 1862. So both armies were now battered, heavily battered, at the end of that day, exhausted. They needed to feed the men, they need to bring water forward um, for the men to drink. They need to bring water forward for horses and artillery. They needed to resupply the men with ammunition, small arms ammunition. I mean, each man was carrying 40 rounds in his ammunition pouch, maybe 20 rounds in his pockets, so and maybe a total of 60, 70 rounds if he was lucky. You can expand that very, very quickly. If you're firing uh, two rounds a minute, and you've got 60 rounds, simple math, if you're just blazing away, you can blaze away for 30 minutes and you're out of ammunition. They weren't blazing away at that sustained rate, but they were certainly expending ammunition quickly on that day and needed to be resupplied. Also, um, they needed to find their wounded on the field that night and try and bring off as many of the wounded as they can. So the armies were in no condition, really either army was in no condition to um, recommence offensive action the next morning on the 18th. Um, Lee stayed in a defensive position, did not want to move. McClellan stayed in a defensive position, did not want to move. There were some truces on the battlefields between units so that they could come out, search for their wounded and bring in wounded. But there's no action on the 18th. And on the evening of the 18th, the Army of Northern Virginia began to withdraw back across the Potomac into Virginia itself. And effectively, um, Lee's Maryland campaign of 1862 is over at that point. So again, we come back to McClellan with what they call the attack of the slows and his caution. Um, he had won a tactical victory here on the day um, because he held command of the battlefield and Lee had withdrawn the next day. Um, it was also a strategic victory because it had sealed the end of Lee's incursion into the north, so the end of that Maryland campaign of 1862. Um, but caution was McClellan's watchword, not wanting to risk anything, overestimating the enemy's strength, so he failed to follow up the attack. Um, he's criticised by Lincoln, who again calls him, you know, accuses him of having an attack of the slows. Lincoln will eventually come out here onto the battlefield after the battle, um, and when McClellan's been sitting here, McClellan will sit here until October. He will not move for over a month. He sits out here for a month, reorganising the men, um, seeing to the wounded in field hospitals, seeing new recruits come in, um, trying to reorganise the regiments, reorganise the divisions, reorganise the corps, resupply the men, reorganise his beautiful army of the Potomac. And he spends an entire month doing that, not following up Lee. Um, 
how Lincoln did not lose his temper and scream and holler at McClellan after that is um, an amazing restraint. Um, he criticizes him privately in conversation and letter, but when he comes here, he tries to persuade him um, to pursue the attack, but does not yell and scream at him, which uh, I think shows remarkable restraint because that would have been um, my reaction. So that's the end of the Battle of Antietam um, and the uh, uh, New Yorkers of the 9th New York, Hawkins Zouaves, have been reduced very much in strength. They were a two-year regiment, so they were raised in April, sorry, mustered into federal service in May of 1861 in the two-year regiments. They will be mustered out in 1863. Um, some of the men will form uh, uh, two companies of veteran infantry which will go on to serve for the remainder of the war but um, Antietam is one of those uh, battles in which some regiments are just reduced to a, a nub. So, the, for example, the Irish Brigade takes a heck of a pounding trying to take the, stone, uh, the sunken road here, and they will then take a heck of a pounding at Fredericksburg um, in the December. So then you get a, when they arrive on the field at Gettysburg, you have regiments that are essentially 80 men in a regiment. So the Irish Brigade is punished heavily at some of these battles. But the 9th New York has clearly been, the Hawkins Suaves have clearly been punished heavily. They came in with less than 400 men and they marched out of the battle with less than 100 men. So um, that's a significant loss. Some of the wounded will return to duty. Some men on furlough will return from furlough. Um, some of the missing will come in later. And there may be the chance of additional recruits, but the 9th New York is never going to reach that full strength again. So was it worth it? I mean, Lee had stood here and fought, but he had no stomach for a continued action after taking those casualties and so withdraw into Virginia. Um, he could have withdrawn into Virginia and not fought, not fought here, but he thought he had a good defensible position and he expected McClellan to attack him, which McClellan did, and he fought a defensive battle and was able to inflict heavy casualties on the Army of the Potomac. He knew McClellan's mind, so he knew that afterwards McClellan would be in a funk and not move and that would give him the space. He'd learned that in the peninsula and the seven days battles. McClellan, as I said, had no stomach for a fight. He had that attack of the slows and caution. Um, the battle's a strategic victory for the North because it ends the Maryland campaign. Um, but the Army of the Potomac is really in no strength and no formation to move, certainly for a week or so, and then inertia sets in uh, with McClellan and they stay here until I believe October the 22nd at which point Lincoln is becoming furious uh, with Little Mac and regarding it, you know, McClellan regards it as his army um, and Lincoln knows that he has no option now but to relieve McClellan from command and he will appoint Major General Burnside to command of the Army of the Potomac and Burnside will take the army down into Virginia and uh, pursue the attack along the Rappahannock which will take us in December uh, to the Battle of Fredericksburg. So. That really concludes the Battle of Antietam and talking about the 9th New York. It's a fascinating study. Their uniforms are bright. They actually is a reenactment unit that dresses as the 9th New York. If you see them on a field of reenactment, you'll see them straight away for their period uniforms with the kepis and the sashes and the white gaiters and the red piping on their fancy baggy pants. So um, speaking of Fredericksburg, I've got tours. I've actually got in-person tours at Fredericksburg. I think during September. So if anybody's going to be in the Fredericksburg area and is looking for an in-person tour, we're actually going to be following the route of the Irish Brigade from City Crossing up until Mary's Heights and the assault on the Stone Wall. So um, some in-person tours in September. Next week, next lunchtime, Tuesday lunchtime next week. So August the 10th, we'll be out at Benners Hill at Gettysburg for another one of these tours. So um, hope to see you there. Another free lunchtime tour. Um, follow me on the Facebook page, which, which this live stream is from. So facebook.com slash walking the ground. I'm also on Twitter. Um, I'm also uploading these videos afterwards to um, YouTube for permanent record in case anything gets deleted from Facebook. So there'll be a YouTube record of this as well. And um, hope you're enjoying these. If there's anything particularly you'd like to see on the Gettysburg battlefield, um, I'll always do free content from Gettysburg. Um, I'll never charge for anything at Gettysburg because 
Um, they have phenomenal um, professional tour guides in the uh, Guides Association, the Blue Coat Guide, the Blue Shirt Guides at Gettysburg, who do a phenomenal job. So when I'm at Gettysburg for my own tours, when I'm walking around on my own at Gettysburg, I always try and do a live stream tour from Gettysburg, which is what I'll be doing last uh, next week. So if there's anything you want to see at Gettysburg, I'm doing Benners Hill next week. So a Confederate artillery battalion under Major General Latimer, the boy general. I'll be doing that next week. I've done the 28th Virginia, I've done the 6th Wisconsin, I've done the 16th Maine, some of these micro histories we've already done. Uh, if you have a relative who fought at Gettysburg and you know which regiment they were in, let me know, regiment, battery, squadron, whatever, and we'll try and hunt out that marker for you, maybe do a little history tour for you on that battlefield. So um, I will wrap up the tour now. Um, I see I've got some comments that I'll be able to uh, reply to in person when I can actually reach a keyboard and do that. But thanks for joining me on the tour today. Thanks for all your support. Um, hope you're enjoying these free tours. Um, check out the web page for in-person tours if you're interested in in-person tours, um, small group tours. Do enjoy those. Do enjoy being on some of the battlefields, um, particularly some of the ones where we can walk through towns and look at the towns and look at some of the street fighting such as uh, Fredericksburg and uh, downtown Baltimore for Pratt Street Riot and that kind of thing. So uh, thanks for tuning in today. Hope I haven't overstayed my welcome. Um, good to see you and I hope I will see you next week at Gettysburg. So until then, have fun walking the ground because I know I do.